Good evening. And welcome to all of you. Welcome to the Computer History Museum and welcome our renowned panelists. So I am, I'm a, I serve a dual role here. I'm kind of a shill for the Computer History Museum as well, having been one of the early members. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to just a couple of people here and, and make sure that uh, I get a commercial in here. So John Tool is the Executive Director Computer History Museum. John, would you just stand up and wave here for everybody to see? <laughs> I became actively engaged when one of my best friends here in Silicon Valley, uh, who was also just recently retired from the Intuit board, Donna Davinsky, and her husband, Lenny Shustak, who have been the visionaries of this. Have, I have understood its importance, the Computer History Museum's importance, and made sure that there was enough money here to be able to make sure that we can not just survive, but prosper. So we have a really special, special panel tonight. And, uh, you know, I go way back um, in, in this business to 1983 when I first came here from Kodak. And most of these were some of the first people that I met. But let me do my Computer History Museum commercial and say that I am an enthusiastic supporter of the museum. I think it's important that we preserve the history, the stories, which you'll, a lot of them you'll hear tonight, of the many great women and men who helped found Silicon Valley and have been responsible for improving the world through technology. I think we have a lot to learn tonight from the experiences that these people provide and from gaining historical context as to what this whole industry was, was about. It wasn't that there were merchants back then and there were writers back then. We were all part of a single industry, and we were very, very, very proud of it. I've been really impressed with the passion of, of the Computer History Museum board here, the staff, the volunteers. I hope that you had an opportunity to meet um, many of them. Today, the museum is in phase one, which means early stages, three exhibits downstairs, the regular tours, the speaker series, and the fellows program. So we have a great volunteer program as well, and all these things are just the beginning. And in the future, we're looking at interactive uh, displays and exhibits, a research institute, and more inspiring programs. So this is a terrific organization for any of you that are interested. Believe me, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, volunteer work. We really feel very, very strongly about preserving the history of this fun wonderful industry. And I think even more than that, the anecdotes, the stories, the friendship, and the camaraderie that we all share. So let's get on to this, this <clears throat> panel. So I'm going to start by, this is a, uh, in, in, in those days, the wild, wild days of computer, we never call it computer retailing. We called them computer dealers back then. And uh, these guys were, these guys were the best. And I can, uh, let me just see if I can't profile each of them. Seymour, Cy Marin, raise your hand, Cy, so everybody knows you are. He was located in Connecticut, and he used to get me in trouble constantly with my boss. I came to Apple. John Skelly had come from Connecticut, knew Cy, and every time Cy didn't like one of my policies, he'd call John Scully, and John Scully would holler at me and make me change it. But he founded Computer Works. You think they're kidding, right? <laughs> he founded Computer Works uh, in 1978 and served multiple markets. He served a lot of retail markets in, the, in, in, in Connecticut, the local area. But what he became famous for was the value added that he was able to provide. And this is a guy that, that made computer retailing really important to corporate programs. So the enterprises were able to buy products from Cymarin. And, and later, you know, businesses formed based on that. Business land is one example. So he is you know, a pioneer in the industry, still active as a consultant, and we're really proud to know him. Second, another really, really good friend, someone that I spent a lot of time with at a lot of different different events, uh, Kathy Colder, founder, co-founder of Fry's. Kathy, wave that hand. I was telling Kathy, Kathy and I would joke about it. Everybody would stay up drinking all night. Of course, we were probably there, too, at all of these trade shows, but... Seven o'clock in the morning, she was always there working out. We were always down there working out together. So she was always pushing me back in those days to try to get the Apple line of products. But there's so much that she offered in terms of merchandising. 
we were talking earlier caroline donahue who's here in the audience tonight is senior vice president of our selling organization at intuit years ago we were stuck with how to do some form of of map pricing minimum advertised price and we were stuck on whether we ought to do it in the high end the low end and i said look let's there's a got a good friend of mine that can come here and and help us with this and we called kathy and she came up to our office and spent an afternoon with us and we designed a plan and that plan is still operative today you know kind of the the grandmother of uh, <clears throat> excuse me maybe only the mother of, <laughs> of map pricing <laughs> i just thought i would mention that yeah. Ellen Miller is, um, as I don't, I don't know, she doesn't, I, she hasn't had to holler at me for not giving her products or being mad at me for not shipping, etc. Hey, but you, <laughs> everybody, but she's the uh, uh, right now acting back in the position of executive VP and chief marketing officer of Comp USA. Welcome, Ellen. Next is Steve Shiro down at the far end. Steve has an extensive um, history in, in computer retailing as well, but it, this, the way I got to know him is we, we hired him at Intuit shortly after I got there and uh, was a fantastic, fantastic uh, selling person and was a good manager, leader. So in September that year, I came in just in early uh, 1994, and he came probably just a few months after that. And that fall, as many of you recall, Microsoft tried to buy into it. And Scott Cook, who's in the audience tonight, is, you know, our founder. And we, Scott and I, might have batted that around forever. But when the time came, it looked like the deal was going to happen. And Microsoft was about to hire a retail sales guy. And they were struggling with that and asked me if I had any recommendations. I said, look, as long as we're going to get together, I got the best guy that you could ever find. His name is Steve Shire, and he works for us. So I talked to Balmer, and I talked to um, uh, Jeff Rakes and Mike Maples and these guys. I said, look, we got a great guy. So what if the deal doesn't go through? Oh, no, the deal will go through. Jesus, this is a pretty simple thing. We've already announced it. Everything's fine. So there was Steve already at Microsoft. They wanted to hurry up and pull the trigger. We put him up there. Of course, we got a second request in the Department of Justice, put the squash on the deal. By May, Steve, instead of being at, at Intuit, Microsoft. Still there today, hugely successful corporate vice president of Microsoft in the home and retail division. He's also the vice president of retail, the Americas Worldwide and Retail Services. Very, very good guy. Congratulations. <laughs> And last are one of the guys that we used to we used to love to hate or hate to love, or I'm not sure what we did, but there were a lot of computer retail magazines at that time. And the most prominent of it was Computer Retail News. And one of the editors and, and, and major writers was Keith Newman. Keith, wave your hand so everybody can see you. He is today the president of Newman Media as his, as his own company. But it was a terrific guy. He had enormous insight into what was going on, championed the retailers and wanted to make sure that slugs like us that were the manufacturers weren't hurting them with inconsistent pricing or bad products, etc. And really did a lot to champion the industry. So tonight in front of you, you have a magnificent panel. I think one that, that will keep you entertained. Keith will be the host of, and moderator of the panel. And I'm going to turn this over to Keith. Thank you. Thank you This is great. This is an old home week or old home night here at uh, the Computer History Museum, and thanks so much for hosting us here. And uh, to Bill, and I think everybody in the industry has a Bill Campbell story, so I might as well start off by sharing mine. Um, so, you know, I started for CRN as a reporter and a writer back in the, uh, in the 80s. I don't want to say what year in the 80s. I, I don't even know what I, if I remember, but um, Bill had taken over, and I believe he was vice president of... Uh, of nonsense at Apple at the time, or you know, one of those cards that they give out. And my editors from CRN, which are based out of New York, said, "Go take down this new hotshot executive from Apple, this steely-eyed guy that they call Coach." And uh, Bill was giving a speech, and my first one of my first assignments was to go interview Bill. 
So I remember listening to him give a presentation and then interviewing him. He, he was so pleasant. He gave me all the time in the world and he's going on, you know, way past my point of interest and in giving me answers to, to uh, questions. And um, no, but it was fantastic. And and it was really giving me the kind of depth that I've grown to really love about the people in this in this little industry. So I file a story and my editors, surprisingly, they love the story. They put it on the front page. And, I, and then uh, I have a call. Oh, it's Bill Campbell calling. He must be calling to thank me and say how, how much he loved the story. Um, as you find in my business, I rarely get those phone calls. <laughs> this is one of those, uh, Keith, you, uh, you screwed me. What happened? <laughs> there was something you took out of context and I got him in trouble with one of his bosses. And uh, it was one of those stories. But... Um, uh, I'm sure none of you other folks have experienced anything like that, um, at least with CRN or the publications I worked for. Um, and Bill, I'm glad to see you rebounded okay from that and you, you sort of survived and managed to, <laughs> to get through it all. Um, you know, but these are the kinds of stories that I want to I share with you tonight, not me so much personally, but this great group of folks that Bill uh, pretty much set the table here. Um, there are some fantastic stories. The interesting thing, you look back um, from the days of the 1980s, and just to kind of paint a picture, the computers and the ones that are shared here in the, in the History Museum, which are so phenomenal and nostalgic, but to think about what went on in this industry, this segment called the channel is, is an interesting room. It almost feels like that, um, uh, the, uh, the warehouse, right? It's sort of part of the Computer Industry Museum, but it's the part that only a few people know about. And it's this arcane sort of black science, and it's phenomenally fascinating, but it's a bit, you know, it's a bit of a niche. It's a bit funky, and some of the people in this industry that have worked the retail industry and the channel and the, the VAR community who know it so well and have a passion for it, it's a, it's a small audience, and it's, a, and it's getting a little bit smaller in some ways, too, although it's getting broader as well. It's, it's a very exciting, dynamic area. So going back, what are we covering? Cy, what, in 1978? Right, you started Computer Works. It was a hobbyist market, right? We'd go to bite shops or Computer Works or um, microwaves. Give me another name or two. Who, who else? Uh, um, computer Land was getting started. And those the computer early com computer earliest Computer Land guys were franchisees selling to the hobbyists, the real people that uh, that built the, the you know the early adopters of the early computer industry. And then from there, you know, the eyes bugged open, and we said, "Wow." VisiCalc, wow, Lotus, you know what, this is beyond hobbyists now, we can go sell this into businesses and the people that took off and sold it to businesses and then Computerland all of a sudden became this just, you know, enormous franchisor that opened up not just, you know, a few in the major metropolitan areas but in every marketplace in the country and in the world and then Businessland came in with its blue suits and white shirts and red ties and said we're going to take over Fortune 1000 and then it became a, a, a corporate computing industry right and the channel became dominated by the the people selling businesses so the uh, the blue suits as it were and the stonebreaker shoes going out and selling to the large corporations and I know Sai, at least you're going to give us a couple stories about knocking on a, a door or two or um, bringing in some new business but then Sai so said, you know what, I've had enough of this. This is just getting too crazy. I'm going to start a consulting business, and it's all around this whole new combination, a combination of selling to the hobbyist, to the business person, and also to the real tech enthusiast in this new business format, this new uh, computer format called the Computer Superstore. And, you know, Ellen's going to share with us some fantastic stories about that because she worked at the most popular um, person to, to sort of um, uh, popularize the whole notion of the computer superstore was CompUSA, and she'll share some of those stories. Um, but I think the company that really has managed to capture the real essence of that also is Fry's. And uh, I can't be more elated. I mean, we're in her back court, but, uh, and, and, you know, Fry's was started as a, the, the famous grocery store um, Fry's name, but um, Kathy and some of her partners with similar back uh, last names as the grocery store founders um, got together and created a concept that I think 
um, exceeded everyone's uh, wildest dreams and imaginations that it sort of equals those of the, the technologists in the audience and the people who have developed the technologies. But um, you know, to think that uh, Fry's Electronics would be 34 stores across the whole country and selling to you know, millions of people. And one of the metrics you look at in retail is how much sales you drive on a per store basis, and they are just just phenomenal. And the whole Fry's Electronics business, uh, we have the person here that really has developed that strategy and continue to evolve that strategy and make it something really special for the consumers in all of those markets. Um, and that's just wonderful. So between Kathy and Ellen from her CompUSA days and her now a lot of her consulting work and Cy gets to look at this and not care about anything because he's retired. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think he, the only thing he works for is the Chamber of Commerce in New Mexico. Because if he corners you and starts telling New Mexico stories, you know, there's going to be a, a pitch there to move down there or open an office or something because he really is wonderful enthusiast for, for New Mexico. And then, of course, we have our token vendor. Not to, not to build in suffice, but I didn't know he was going to share. Uh, but and we'll have Bill back up if he wants to share some more stories. But who better than somebody from Microsoft that... You know, Microsoft, you know, is, is viewed obviously as the, as the major manufacturer of, of software and packaged products in the industry. Um, and, and, you know, Steve Shiro has been just a champion of the channel for oh, way too long. Way too long. He has done a phenomenal job of not just promoting his products, but trying to promote his channel internally and externally and just building a, a very fertile ground for you know, the entire marketplace. And I think that's something that, you know, goes largely unrecognized. And, you know, I certainly had to mention that. So, um, you know, I want to hear from these folks, as I'm sure you do. We are going to hear some stories now about sort of what just happened over the last 20 years. Give, give us your perspective of how this market and this channel um, has evolved and some of your perspectives of those tipping points or those um, inflection points in the marketplace. Um, and then give us some of your prognostication forecast. So maybe we'll do a quick reset and look at what, what's going to happen in the next 20 years. What, what might a store look like? What might a channel look like? What might you all be doing <laughs> in 10 years or so? And I want to encourage questions. So we'll go through a, a round of, of some discussion from these folks, and then we'll look forward to some questions. How's that sound? Is that good? Great. So, Ellen, can I start off with you, the marketing chick now? with the most jazzy of blazer and uh, a few slides. Yeah, Thanks, absolutely, folks. absolutely. All right, looky there, watch that technology work here. Um, my name is Ellen Miller, as I've been introduced. I am uh, the president of Insider Marketing and Insider Creative. This is a consulting and creative agency dedicated totally to bringing technology products to market. Um, but prior to founding the company 12 years ago, I was the vice president of merchandising for CompUSA. And I started with the corporation in 1990 when they were software house. Oh, were those the days when people would line up because they couldn't wait to get their hands on a 286. Let me tell you, these people were excited. And it was an incredible time to be a part of the industry. Um, I was the weird one at Software House. I was the only one of the executives brought in from the technology industry. And so we were um, run by people from um, other classic retailers. And um, uh, one was from Home Depot. Many of you may have known um, my dear mentor, Nathan Morton. And um, this is what he had envisioned uh, for Software House in those early days. I started with the company when they um, opened store number three. And um, this is what you would see almost on a given Saturday. And it was just absolute magic that we could sell hard drives in these little, you know, sleeves, right? And in and, and packs and packs of software that were in, you know, disk in baggies. We didn't even have packages back then. And I know I beat my head up against the wall trying to, you know, encourage people to do some of these things. Um, but then uh, this is what a preprint looked like uh, when we were selling 486s for $1,288. Oh, if we could do that today. <laughs> oh, my God. Back in these days, we made money. And uh, you probably... <laughs> 
I'll tell you, you know, I've been gone for, call, for, for 12 years, and um, they asked me to come back about 90 days ago to help them. Uh, they're in a difficult time, and so um, I've come in as their acting chief marketing officer um, to consult with them um, and be with them through the first quarter of uh, 2007 to help, uh, help them kind of take a new look at their business. But one thing that I realized as I was looking through the old preprints and the ones that will be hitting um, the paper, you know, on Sunday, as we're still leading with things like diskettes, but here they were $39.99. Oh, my God. Again, we were making money instead of flash drives, right? But it was, it was a fun, exciting time. Um, then, you know, in about 1995, Software House realized that they um, would have a very difficult time going public with the name Software House, and so we changed our name to Comp USA. And um, not a very sophisticated marketing campaign, um, but uh, th this was the way that we launched um, uh, the new name of the company, which did stick. Now, some of you may remember PC Modem and Bob. Do any of you guys remember them? They were pretty um, instrumental. This was a just a fabulous radio spot um, for uh, Quicken, 1998, I think, you know, or QuickBooks or TurboTax, TurboTax. It was TurboTax 1998. And it was a really, really fun spot. You know, but the, the whole idea behind PC Modem and Bob, the whole idea behind the radio commercial was that um, we wanted technology to be approachable. And uh, we didn't want our customers to be fearful that it wouldn't work. We've introduced um, Bob and Meg Pixels. And so instead of PC Modem being the technology expert, Meg Pixels is the technology expert. And the idea for CompUSA, who has always focused solely on the male audience, at ages 25 to 54, um, <laughs> You know, I, it was a really tough sell for me to convince them that women actually, you know, they actually buy technology. Um, so we did some field trips and we counted women in uh, the stores and they went, holy cow, there's women here. And so um, uh, this has been, this is a really fun campaign that the company um, launches uh, on November the 19th. And again, it's all about making the technology approachable um, and exciting and fun. And, uh, you know, we really couldn't do it without our vendor partners who have just been fabulous to that corporation and to our industry as a whole uh, with your investments in R&D. Um, you know, truly, we, the, the retailers would be nowhere without the manufacturers. So uh, with that, I will say thank you. So I think Ellen gave you, mm, from the CompUSA point, that was the legitimate side of retailing, as I would call it. <laughs> Fries was the illegitimate side of retailing. You know, um, but, you know, until I was asked to speak tonight, I didn't understand that I was actually a relic, a historic... <laughs> um, and then I found out I was grandmother and... That's my son Jake in the front row. He's only nine, so it's more surprising to him. But, um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, while we were applauding Software House that became CompUSA as bringing all of these non-high techies into the industry, Fry's has always had the focus from when we started that we were focused on a one-stop shop for the computer and high-tech professional. And so we focused on engineers. We opened up in the heart of Silicon Valley, which to us was the New York. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. So that was really where we were and what we wanted to be was the engineer store. And our concept when we opened, we thought we were actually going to only be selling mostly components. We were going to sell mostly chips because that was what people wanted to do was build the computers in their homes and their garages and focus on that. And the first weekend we opened, we sold some printer cables for $19.95, and they were kind of in the IBM stores and Computerland and Businessland for $99.95. And so all of a sudden, boom, we ran out of printer cables in an hour. And uh, we said, huh, maybe people want to buy computer stuff too. Who knew? We thought it was easily available. And so we went and switched. But nobody would authorize us. 
IBM wouldn't talk to us. In fact, not, not authorize us. They wouldn't talk to us. They wouldn't take my phone calls. <laughs> the sales rep, no, you know, hung up. I, I swear, you know, they would see me at conferences. I went to conferences, all these different conferences, just to go up to these people. They would run. They would turn the other way. Oh, there is that girl again. Oh, my God, she's bugging. You know, boom. And, you know, I was going to take up wearing disguises because, they, you know, across the room, they'd leave. And, you know, I don't know how many times, Bill, hello, we should be selling Apple. Yeah, well, you know, we, we're trying to keep the price up, and, you know, we want to be at legitimate dealers like CompUSA. And <laughs> so, you know, we were focused on that. And, but who we were was really the antithesis of that. We opened up with bathrooms, shopping carts, and snack foods. You know, jolt, cola, and potato chips, because this is what every engineer had at their desk. Six-pack in the drawer, big, large bags, not little bags, large bags of potato chips, right? And they wanted to go throw it in a shopping cart, go down the aisle, buy their chips, throw the stuff in, and leave. Boom, like that. And also, everybody wanted to touch the products. Nobody wanted it behind a case, in a picture, away from them. Everybody wanted to see, does it work? You know. Techies in those days were non-believers of everything. You know, they knew they, they made it. They knew. <laughs> so, so they were like, well, let's see if this actually works. And in the beginning, what we were doing was completely radical. It was illegitimate. Everybody kept saying illegitimate because we were taking and we were, excuse me, those with, you know, we were bastardizing all the products. We took an IBM computer box and we put in somebody else's monitor card, and somebody else's monitor, and somebody else's printer, and a different cable. And we bought products from, oh my gosh, overseas. And um, it was scary concepts in those days. And um, I became nicknamed the queen of the gray market. And um, because in those days, the gray market was considered like almost illegal. Now, none of it was illegal. I'll tell you all that now. <laughs> Because, you know, we did check with lawyers because we were concerned about, you know, getting arrested, those kind of things. But a lot of my first purchases, because I couldn't get the legitimate products, you know, direct from the manufacturers, were actually um, with cashier's checks off the back of trucks, buying the overstock from all the other computer dealers that had gone out of business trying to sell it. And there was never a short supply. So... Eventually, some pe people said, gee, we got to stop these people. And so almost every day I'd be helping the, the IBM or HP or Apple people come in and try and find the serial numbers on the back and trace it back to find out who, where this came from. And they would always find out that, gee, a lot of those people weren't in business anymore. And so finally one day they said, well, look, maybe we should just talk to you. <laughs> And so I started making the rounds in everybody's offices. And HP said, you know, if IBM authorizes you, we will too. And Apple said, well, you know, if you were legitimately selling IBMs, we'd sell to you too. So I went to HP and I said, you know what? IBM said, if you sell us, they'll never sell me. And so HP said, okay, we'll sell you. <laughs> so, And so then, the next day, I called up IBM, and I said, uh, I got HP. And they said, okay, we'll sell you. So <laughs> next day, called up Apple. Guess what? IBM's shipping in. Okay. So there we went. So the funny part was, it was literally, we went a year and a half, almost two years in business with not anything authorized. And within a week, boom, all the contracts. So all of a sudden... You know, I stopped uh, buying off the back of trucks at night, which was, that was the literal picture. Um, <laughs> and uh, started, you know, actually placing purchase orders. And um, st still putting together, though, the computer systems with other people's things hooked up, all the different product. And everybody kept saying, well, you know, really, the customers want to buy the same monitor with the same system. They want all the same name all there together on sitting there on the platform. So we would display them like that on one table, and then the other table would have the mixed up stuff. And 
you know, the customers bought always the mixed up stuff. And uh, in those days, you know, what Bill was talking about, about we were all one group. We really were one group. It wasn't like um, even the consumer electronics group then. We all sat in rooms together and would talk about things and we'd try and work out how to increase the industry. Because for us, it was like almost a matter of survival in the beginning days was how do we grow the industry? How do we make this industry survive? You know, will people other than engineers and high tech people ever be able to use this product? Will they ever want to buy it? Will anybody ever have it? You know, and now you sit there and, you know, I reflect back and, you know, my son says to me, well, mom, how did you ever talk to anybody without a cell phone? <laughs> and, and, you know, I think back and how much I text people, I think, how did I get along before email and texting? Did I ever talk to anybody? I don't remember writing all those letters, but then I do remember chasing everybody down at conferences. So <laughs> there was a different way. And so now we put together these things, have this company growing, and start opening places. And one of the things Keith asked me was, would you tell like what you thought your biggest disaster was? So the thing that almost put us out of business was after we had opened three stores, we decided we needed a warehouse. Um, there were things in that warehouse that we didn't even know existed because we found inventory management was really tough because of the computer systems that we were trying to use to manage technology, none of the products switched that quickly. All the product systems out there in those days were made for like grocery stores. And we had a grocery store system because my partner's family had been in the grocery store business. So we had modeled our whole fries setup after grocery stores. We had shopping carts, bathrooms, like I said, snack foods. But we also had the same kind of inventory systems and management systems and product placement and schematizing all of our shelves based on that system. But technology was moving so fast that a product would be obsolete three months later. You know, you were selling it for the, the sales value of the product would start out and within one week would drop by 20%. And by a month later, it would be 30% lower. And three months later, it was half price. And six months later, you probably couldn't find it or it was in the clearance rack. And that was true for all the SKUs. So when you put together a warehouse and you were trying to use a grocery store inventory system, it completely collapsed inward on us because that was made for stuff like Cheerios that has been around for, I don't know, how long has Cheerios been around? 100 years. Some, okay. It wasn't made to change product SKUs on. So we actually went in and had to write our own inventory system and did it all using microcomputers, personal computers. We put them on PCs. Sorry, those Apple people out there, but we put them on PCs. And we ran spreadsheets on it. And we had spreadsheets up on every wall in our company. And we started doing all of our own product stuff there so that we could track the inventory fast enough because that was the only thing that actually worked. And um, we used QuickBooks. <laughs> after we realized that our accounting system was also behind the times on how quick it was when we were trying to switch vendors. Because again, the vendors were going out of business and coming into business, <laughs> not quite as fast as the products, but pretty fast in the early days. And the systems didn't want us to like keep trying to, repay, to pay different people for the same products you know, that we were buying. So it was very interesting. It was a challenge, the technology industry combining with the regular retail industry was extremely challenging at first because of especially we were very skew heavy as most of you know in the <laughs> company and even in the beginning days you know we were we had probably 50,000 skews and to try and manage that and turn them over at that with a array of vendors that were changing constantly was such a challenge uh, in the retail grouping that it was almost insurmountable. And so when we put it in a warehouse, it almost killed us because we couldn't manage the warehouse at all. So once we realized, we, uh, since we don't know how to do this, we'll just ship directly to all the stores, that's what changed our store size overnight, double the size. Because <laughs> we decided to inventory in the stores for everything we needed for all the customers and that we would do our sales based on what the customers were buying at a store-by-store -store location. 
So when the customer is buying this much in this store, this store would have that much of that product. And if they were only buying half that much in the other store, they'd only have half that much in the other store. To our vendors, this was an absolutely radical concept and one that they couldn't accept because they kept telling us, well, if you're selling 100 in this store, you should sell 100 in this store, so we want you to ship 100 into this store too because that's the way it works. We said, no, we're only selling 75 here. We're only going to ship in 75. We're only going to ship in 50 over here. And in this store, we're only going to ship in five because they don't even buy this product. And that, people said, it's never going to work. But that was really the key to our success in keeping us in business because that was the only way to manage the margins that, as most of you know, shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk continually, was to make sure that we were down to the item. So 100 became 98, and 75 became 67, and it became that exacting store-by-store -store basis based on selling. And the concept that we kept constant in the growth of the business was really the fact that we were customer-driven, and we kept that one focus from our founding on to today. It's been about a one-stop shopping environment for the high-tech professional. And so that is where we've always gone and what we've always done. And um, I have a funny story about when we bought Incredible Universe. So uh, like I said in the beginning, I used to speak on a lot of panels um, and go out there just so I could meet the right people in the industry, get the right product, because in the beginning days, we were having to sell fries to the vendors so that they would sell to us. I would go out and beg them to sell a product. And I did have some people coming in and selling, but those people used to not have any boxes, any packaging, no marketing funds, and nothing to do advertising with, and, uh, which was really the way we developed demo days. That was how demonstrations got done because I said, well, how are we going to sell this? Well, why don't you come in on Friday and Saturday and see if anybody wants to buy the product? <laughs> People would, people did, everybody got excited, and we started running ads for demo days every week, and it became like kind of one of our events was that we demonstrated the product every week in all of our stores. So in 1992, Tandy started the Incredible Universe chain, and um, being public, they had lots of money, and they spent it and opened up a lot of stores all at once. And so by 1995, they had almost gone out of business. And their concept was supposed to be the same as our concept, but as to what they said, it was the improved version. And, but the customers didn't like it. And, you know, we looked at why they didn't like it and could we, you know, buy their stores um, when they were going out of business and keep them operating and could we switch them into our concept because we were trying, we went in and analyzed what happened there. And we realized that, first of all, they locked the customers in a maze in the retail setup because you used to have to go in a circle to buy from them and to get out. So you couldn't, like, just go straight across the store. You could only go through every part of the store. And we had a lot of our um, engineering customers said, no way would they ever go in that store one, a second time. And that was our customer base. So we said, well, okay, we could blow out all the walls inside. And um, maybe that will work. And then they had a lot of the same product mix and, you know, demonstrated it throughout the stores, uh, but they didn't have the depth of SKUs because they thought that there was only, customers really only wanted to buy basically lost leader product, which that's not a good business model because <laughs> there's no way to make money after that. So we, <laughs> we decided, boy, maybe we'll add depth of SKUs. So we went in and did that. And so um, we took over their stores, uh, eight of them, and kept all the employees that we could. Um, well, we wanted to keep them. But we decided we, we've done drug testing uh, since we've started way back in the early 90s. We started drug testing before pre-employment screening. And because uh, we found that people that weren't on drugs full time were more productive. And um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, there are some exceptions, but um, <laughs> those will go nameless. So we started drug testing before people came in for employment. And uh, especially, you know, dealing with the public, you know, it, it's hard enough to screen people that are selling on a retail sales floor anyway. So we started drug screening them. So by the time we were taking over the Incredible Universe stores, we had to go out and we said, well, look, you know, 
we'll try and take all the employees we can, except they're going to have to go through drug screening and pass drug screening. Okay, fine. So we go to the first store, and I'm with, you know, this corporate executive attorney group from Texas. And um, I have Jake with me, and he is uh, three months old at the time. And um, so I'm shuttling him around with me because I'm still breastfeeding. So he's traveling with me in like a backpack. And so uh, we're in there, and the Texans are kind of like these people from California. I just don't even know. And then, so then I said, okay, well, um, I have the drug screening results for the first store. And we were up in Wilsonville, Oregon, which is like a hole-in-the-wall small town outside of Portland. But there's a lot of engineers in that area, so... We, we took all their existing employees, and there was like 200 of them, and we drug screened them. And I said, so there's a lot of people here that we can't keep. And they're like, why? This is terrible. You told us you were going to take everyone you could. And I said, well, we're going to take everybody that passed the drug test. And I said, um, unfortunately, we had a lot of false tests. And they said, well, let's get a new drug screening company. I said, no, not that, that's not the problem. People brought in monkey urine, cow urine. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, and they said, well, what are we going to do about that? And I said, well, we can't hire them because, and they said, well, why do you think they brought that in? <laughs> I said, well, this could be another reason that the success wasn't very good. So we had a great time. <laughs> By the second store, they were more prepared for results, and they actually put out a memo to the associates on the second store we were taking over and said, please do not bring in samples of animal urine. And uh, I thought it was a good memo. And um, so um, the, the next thing that happened is, is they didn't realize that when they did the drug screening that people brought in samples that, you know, these are creative people, right? They're in high tech. They brought, you know, you can go on the Internet and find out pretty much everything. You know, this is the early 90s, and if you actually are techie, you know how to use it. So these people brought in samples that were real but from their friends. And... Um, they were temperature tested, and they didn't realize that. So then these guys failed, too. So next door, of course, another memo came out. Please bring in warm urine. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we handed out. So I said, you know, this is not going to work. So for the next door, we, I sent out the memo. I said, can I send out the memo this time? So I put out a memo, and I said, this screening will screen for drugs used. And... The urine must be your own, at your own body temperature, and it does detect if it's from an animal. Please, pee in your own cup. <laughs> and uh, we actually had better results because the people from the first and second stores had called up their friends at the next store and said, you guys, stop doing drugs for a while. <laughs> so we got better results each store that went on. So. The, the people from Texas said, you know, it's amazing what we're learning here. <laughs> and uh, so after we had taken over all the stores, about six months later, you know, which had been a year from when we had cut the first deal, we decided we were going to have a dinner with the executives, the Tandy and our executives, to, you know, talk about it and go over all the successes and not. And uh, we sat down at dinner and we were talking about that. They said, well, we see that you've um, remodeled the stores. And I, we said, yeah, well, you know, we got rid of the maze effect, you know, so we blew out everything. And they said, yeah, and we see that you've um, changed around a lot of the, the setups we had. And I said, well, yeah, I said, you know, here I thought I was done with being illegitimate and having companies tell me I won't authorize you. And we got to the IUs and they had McDonald's in all of their cafes authorized from McDonald's. They were in-store cafes. McDonald's wouldn't authorize us. They said uh, that they didn't like the way we did business because it wasn't wholesome enough. And I talked to, we're sitting down, and I said, so, you know, I was very confused, and I said, uh, why do you think that was? Because one of their, their general counsel was very good friends with the general counsel from McDonald's Corporation, and he was the one that had been present during all of the different samplings. And he says, because you did drug testing. And I said, well, but that would be a good thing, right? That we weren't. And he goes, no, because you knew people were using drugs. <laughs> I said, okay, well, you know, information is a tough thing in this age. But <laughs> so we went on, and um, 
uh, one of the IU stores, uh, the San Diego one, that had been their least performing one, and our whole deal was based on the fact that we actually had to take that store from them, you know, or we couldn't take the rest of them. That is one of our top stores in the chain and has been since we took it over. And um, uh, with a great customer base down there, and uh, so... So that's been a great success story with that, and, and I'm proud to say we've kept 62% up to this day, now it's just 10 years later, of the IU staff that we took over that had come over and passed drug tests. So, so that was a real fun thing, you know, with that in retail. Um, let's see. I think the big thing in retail is, is that the whole thing was truth is really stranger than any fiction you can write. I think I have, like... Um, you know, someday I think that that will that'll be my next career if I ever retire, would be uh, to write a book on all the retail things that can happen because uh, it's been a lot of fun. But we have, like, uh, two key philosophies, I think, at Fry's. One is that uh, our success is due to a four-letter word, which is work. And uh, nobody likes that word. Nobody likes to hear it. And nobody likes to use it. But it's key for everything that we do, and it just... In retail, it never goes away. You know, it never gets easier. You never cross over that barrier where you have it because it's a day-by-day-by-day -day -day thing um, with all the hours and uh, everything. And uh, But our second thing is is that you got to keep having fun with it. And, um, and, and I'm still having a lot of fun with our stores uh, and what we're doing in the business and growing. And I think the best thing we did, which was the other thing you asked me to say, was what, what was the thing I learned and I'm glad that, we have, and uh, I think it would be that we started private and that we're still private. I think that, that might be one of my most positive things because it's allowed us to do a lot of fun things now that now that Sarbanes Oxley is running around that um, uh, has been a great deal for us, <laughs> so that we can keep having fun and keep opening stores and and uh, sports and sports teams and golf courses and things like that. Um, but we have. Uh, we have a, um, a great charity that we've also started called uh, the American Institute of Mathematics um, that is, uh, while I'm here at the Computer History Museum, it's a very simpatico thing that I wanted to point out because it, um, we have uh, some of the world's current foremost mathematicians on as members of uh, the American Institute of Mathematics. And um, we have a lot of grants and foundations from... Um, a lot of people in the government, too, but it's a, it's a huge charity Fry supports uh, continually. And they're out solving math problems is all they do. Uh, they get together a couple times a year at conferences and solve math problems. And because um, we think that going forward and the future of the industry and computing is based on being able to bring mathematics up so that it can bring the engineering up so that we can develop new things. And uh, we think math might be falling behind because there's a lot of... Uh, theorems out there that still haven't been solved. And so right now, uh, they've done that. And I'm proud to say that in the last uh, five years that we've had uh, AIM, um, they've turned in 80 papers and solved 80 previously unsolved math problems. Um, so it's been a real great thing. And going forward, uh, we're still trying to work to get the computer industry growing because we're proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Kathy, that was great. I um, get you out more though speaking in public because since uh, you used to go call on the vendors, you were out a lot more. And now that you're working more on the operations and uh, the HR and all the other fun stuff, you don't get out as much. So you have all these stories you have to share. And I think there's there's this wonderful perception of, of, of fries, but it's not always that positive. So when you, can, when, when you can get out more and share the persona, I think it makes it a lot. I think it makes fries a lot more. I think it paints a real a lot more realistic picture of fries, actually. And um, listen, Grandma is uh, getting on a plane tonight to open up store number 34 in uh, Georgia today, tomorrow. tomorrow. And I think if nothing else, it, it, and, and I'm sure Cy will share some stories and attest to this, that four-letter word, you know, it, uh, it doesn't go away no matter what your role in the company. And uh, I'm glad you're still having fun and that passion still thriving. And Cy, we, we had so many fun chats about uh, the computer industry. Everything going to... I hope you have some new stories now, so I don't... Uh... Yeah, I, I do, but I, I have to say that uh, one of the things I used to teach my salesman when I had my store, 
assiduously and over and over again, Ellen proved tonight to be absolutely true, and that is sales are inversely proportional to demonstrations. <laughs> I heard that one. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> My, my perspective is a little different. I started a little earlier than these young kids here. Um, and I started a small store when it was still primarily a, a hobbyist business back in 78 in Westport, Connecticut. And um, I did because I just started to get interested in computers. And I looked at such things as the TRS-80 and the Apple II and what have you, and I finally decided to buy an Apple II. This was in, uh, in early 78. And the only place around that sold them was a computer land, and I went in there, and I had been reading all I could. And uh, after looking at TRS-80, I decided the Apple II was what I really wanted. And I said I wanted to buy one, and they sort of thought that was nice. And I said, I've been reading about these disk drives, which had just come out. And uh, they said, yeah, we could probably get you one of those. And I said, I'd like a two-drive system. Why? They could not understand why I needed the second drive. I mean, you could take it in, you know, keep pushing it in and out and all that. I said, I want two drives. And they finally agreed to sell me a two-drive system. And it took me six weeks. I had to pay up front, and it took me six weeks to get it. But after about 15, 20 minutes with it, I realized that, my God, if there were only software, there'd be an industry here. <laughs> and uh, But I said, but with a platform, this at that time inexpensive, which was very expensive by today's uh, terms, uh, there probably will be software because it's so easy to use in, in essence. So, and at that time, they were, I was working for Exxon Enterprises, which is the, was the venture group at Exxon, where I was running a uh, light sensing semiconductor division. And Exxon decided that entrepreneurs were not good for a company the size of Exxon, so we were on the way out, and I had to decide what to do. And I was so excited with my Apple II, despite the fact that I had never had any retail experience, that I would open a store, because there was only one other store in Connecticut, which was this computer land, and I could make enough of a living that I'd find out what the industry was all about, and if possible, I would get into one of the manufacturing sides of it, because that was my history. I was in uh, semiconductor manufacturing. So I started a store in 78. The little snippet of a story that I had was after studying about retail and deciding what the parameters for the location of the store I wanted were and you know and all this and I went out and I and I took the only spot that was available you know <laughs> that was it and uh, I sold enough computers to stay alive and all that and uh, began to get a reputation in the area for, for really top quality service and knowledge and then in September of 79, I received in the mail a black loose-leaf notebook with, you know, plastic packages with five-and-a-quarter-inch drives in it from uh, a company called VisiCorp, and it was, the you know, the prototype of the VisiCal. And I didn't even look at it much. I had heard about it through meetings and what have you, but I had never seen it or anything like that. And I went home that night because it was too busy in the store, and I put it on my home machine. And after only about ten, and by the way, I used to, when I was at Exxon, we used to spend two weeks twice a year on planning. The whole management staff was, you know, bogged down in this thing. And I, after 10 or 15 minutes, I called in my wife and said, "Hun, if I had had this at Exxon, I could have saved man centuries. And I believe that. And one of the things that was mentioned here, I think, by Bill, was within three months I had three professionals selling to corporate America because I could take that package of an Apple, 48K Apple II, you know, a, a 12-inch NTSC monitor, and my difference was I put a neck spin writer on it. And the reason I did that was that you could program the neck and you could actually get a crude graph by programming the period to give you a graph of the results. And so I was selling this package for $8,000. Wow. 
at a little better than 40 points of margin. So my salesmen were making a fortune. I was, everybody was happy. And the companies who bought it were saving twelve to $14,000 a month on timeshare. So they were happy. So it was a very nice thing, and we started selling more and more. And, and in my mind, the true beginning of the industry was the day I received that package from VisiCal. Because that was what really drove the industry and drove people to think of it as a professional tool. Now, I'll give you one little, this Keith knows I had my little Marinisms. Uh, my concept of why VisiCalc was so popular and so fantastic in the corporate world was there was an effect that I called competitive panic. Because if one guy got, was bold enough to get an Apple II with VisiCalc on it, Immediately, he became the focus for information. He could do what ifs. Nobody else in the company could do what ifs. So he became very well appreciated by his boss. And then the guy next door, you know, uh, next uh, department would be interested. But everybody else in that department was getting, hey, why should he get all the kudos? So they demanded their own. And the next department demanded their own. And it literally, in order to compete with the guy who had Busy Cal, everybody had to have one. And I think that's what drove the industry. And, of course, and then came all of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the growth and what have you. And, of course, that's also what precipitated the IBM PC. I, being in Westport, Connecticut, it's right next to Westchester where the IBM corporate offices were. And I had dozens and dozens and dozens of IBM guys who were my customers. And... On top of that, one of my larger customers at corporate clients was IBM. I was selling into their financial departments from the various divisions like crazy. But the first time I tried selling them, I put Apple Computer down, and the purchase order got all bought down in the corporate things. You can't buy another computer, you know, and they had to have run research and all that. So I never sold them another Apple Computer I only sold them spreadsheet calculators. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you adapt. You adapt. And, uh, what do you call it? And, uh, what happened then, you know, was the IBM and all that. Uh, when Kathy gave, well, I mean, I, I really, I've known Kathy for God knows how long, and I've known Fry since they began. And my admiration is, has always been, as you know, great for your organization. And I also believe, which I'll talk about in a minute, that you were the only guys who really knew the customer. But, um, uh, but at any rate, IBM, in the beginning, they authorized only Computerland and the new Sears stores to sell their computer. But they had a program for authorizing new dealers, which required you doing a whole business plan. I mean, it was a very sophisticated thing. And for anybody here who happened to know about this, I could tell you that I was the first, absolutely number one in their decision-making process, independent dealer they created. And for nine months, I was the only IB, independent IBM dealer in all of New England and New York combined. A very nice, profitable time. <laughs> uh, but it, it was great, and it helped grow the industry. But around then, I had known, since my days at Exxon Enterprises, I had known a uh, guy named Ben Rosen. You all know who Ben Rosen is, I hope. And uh, when he was still at Morgan Stanley and ran the semiconductor and the PC conferences. And uh, Ben called me up one January in 82, and said, can you come down to my office? I got something to show you. And he, he, I went down there next time I was in New York visiting some of my clients and he showed me these drawings and gave me a spiel about why this new computer was really going to be something. And he really chose the wrong words and led me down the wrong path. And I said, Ben, I think it's a stupid idea. And of course, a few weeks later was his big conference at that time. I think it was in Palm Springs. And he says, look, I want you to, 
to take another look at this, the guy who's running this thing is a guy named Rod Canyon, and he's up in room so-and-so. So I, I went up to see Rod Canyon, and he explained the compact computer to me, and I said, my God, that's a great idea. <laughs> you know, it's going to work. And uh, so at any rate, I got introduced to the, to the concept of the compact. Now, by this time, I was selling IBM, and IBM really thought dealers were idiots. They, you know, they didn't deserve the time of day, and they had to tell the dealers what to do, and it was really not a nice relationship, you know, despite the fact they sold us stuff. They required their payment in 30 days, but of course our customers never gave us <laughs> payment in 30 days. So anyway, it, 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 so we were having a, a testy relationship. So this little compact looked like a good thing. And then one of my, my great stories that I really love is in June of that year, I was visiting one of my clients, which is a department, uh, one of the departments in Citicorp in New York. And the guy was in charge of the Far East. And uh, as I was leaving his office after the doing our business. He said, by the way, do you carry any portables? My guys out in the Far East need 200 of these things. And I said, there isn't a portable on the market that I'd be willing to sell. And I said, but there's something I know about. Let me check whether I can show it to you or not. So as soon as I got far enough away uh, from the building, in those days he didn't have cell phones, so I went to a public phone. I called Ben, and I said, Ben, I, by the way, not many people will know this because it never really was very well known, but the original name of Compact Computer Corporation was, believe it or not, Gateway Computer Corporation. <laughs> Honest to God. And I said, are you willing to show the gateway? And I told him why. And he said, and I can remember this conversation explicitly, he said, well, Rod is coming up with a prototype next Thursday. And if these guys are willing to sign a disclosure, we'll show it to him. So a couple of days later, I called him up, and they were willing to sign a disclosure. So I was in Ben's office, and Rod comes up from the airport with a cardboard box. Inside was a prototype compact. It didn't even have a lid on it. And the three of us went down to City Corp, and they signed the disclosures. And I don't know how many of you remember, but the compact had a screen that switched between graphics and text. So you could do both graphics and text. It was the only machine at the time when CGA was the graphics that you could do that with. And Ben did the demonstration, and what he demonstrated was an alpha version of Lotus 1, 2, 3. And it was the first time either one of those products was ever seen in the outside world. And to me, that, of course, I walked out with a purchase order and all that. But... Uh, <laughs> As soon as I left the office and we were far enough away, I said, Ben, what the hell's that software? You know? And I got very excited, so I got involved with them and all that sort of thing. And I was the one who convinced Lotus that what they should do is once they had a solid product, even though it would take a little bit longer, go to what was then the MIS, now the IT department, and make the manager a beta site. Even if you have to put in some obvious bugs, make these guys a beta site. And, of course, they did so that when that product was released, there was instant sales. I mean, we, we were able to sell it to these corporations just, uh, you know, rapidly. And here comes part of the old thing, which I don't know, it may have brought me in conflict. Now, of course, you weren't even in existence at that time, Kathy. Uh, I was selling... In my little store in Westport, Connecticut, I was selling 2% of Lotus's entire output. Okay? At list. <laughs> and I couldn't get the product I wanted. I only got a fraction of what I wanted. And people started discounting. I said, now, wait a minute. I can sell all I can get at list, and people are discounting? No, <laughs> something's wrong here. <laughs> But this is continued to the present day. At any rate, uh, <laughs> uh, but this is this is sort of sort of the fun stuff. And uh, but again, as Bill said early on, we we were known because we were really the the forerunners of the corporate sales. 
and uh, we led the way. We lost business because of discounting. We never lost business because of quality or support or our ability to do things. IBM, if there are any IBMers here, I, I hope you're saying, IBM actively, actively supported the gray market. Many of this product that Kathy and other people got were from dealers who they preferred and who, in order to maintain their discount level on the purchase, were allowed to and knowingly allowed to ship product to the gray market. That's one way they, 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 they and I won't even mention who some of those people were. And one time when I told, I think, Keith or somebody about a particular gray market who was being shipped directly from IBM, <laughs> and I had the data to prove it, IBM threatened to take my, uh, uh, my dealership away from me. And I had to go with my lawyer down to Boca Raton and all sorts of things with threats on both sides, and finally they gave up on that. But at any rate, uh, the bit, it, I was involved just because I was, you know, from the early days you knew everybody. You know, we knew Bill and we knew Steve and, you know, and all these guys because everybody, it was just a small industry that we were all interested in following. Bill remembers, and I certainly, Chris Olson is here, uh, who knows about the early days of the Apple Dealer Advisory Council, and we really tried helping each other. We became friends, all the dealers. We became friends with the people at Apple, and we were trying to improve the industry. And uh, most of the time, we were pretty active. There's one fellow, I forget his name, it was an Armenian fellow who had the computer land down here in, uh, on San Antonio in Palo Alto. If any of you remember his name, give it to me because I'm, I'm bad on names. Uh, at every meeting he used to say, this was, this was a sort of a, a routine. He'd say, we need more memory on our disk drives. And what was his name, the original sales guy? Jim uh, Carr used to say, We've, we've surveyed our users. 146 is all they need. And this guy would say, we're not talking about need, we're talking about wants. People want more memory. Well, what do you want? You want us to give you 500? Give me 500, please. But if you can give me more, give me more. What do you mean? You want a megabyte? Give me a megabyte. <laughs> Anything you can give me, I can sell. <laughs> you know? Couldn't convince them. Couldn't convince them. Uh, when the Apple III came out, it's a nice machine, which they crippled pretty badly. Apple did. Uh, shortly after it came out, a company called in uh, Denver called Quark came out with a word processor. I got a copy of that, and I went through the roof. This is the greatest word processor on a personal computer that ever was. And I used to sell this thing into corporate America as a standalone word processor. And it had all the professionalism that the Wang had. And I brought a disc with me to an Apple dealer advisory council. I said, take a look, take a look, take a look. And they said, what? We have a word processor. We have Apple Writer 3. And then nobody would look at it. But I left it with a couple of people who sort of were interested. By our next meeting, Everybody was using that program, but Apple would not promote it, which blew my mind. Little things like that. Um, I won't go into a lot of the details of why I left my dealership and all that sort of thing and went into the consulting business. But um, one of the things I want to do that I was more interested in the business side, but Kathy and the people at Fry's really understood the customers. Nobody else in the industry did. Uh, one of the things my company did was do, was do research, and one of the things we did fairly early, well, no, this was after actually the computer stores got, uh, superstores got moving, was we did intercept studies where we talked to customers going in and out of stores. And one of the things we found out that, that I don't think the industry believes even today was the overwhelming amount of purchases, we're talking about the 80 percentile of the purchases, went to experienced users. 
The new user market was fictitious almost from the beginning. And uh, they were both business users and engineering users. But those are the people who bought. Who bought. When uh, you know, Bill talked about the aborted marriage between, uh, between Microsoft and Intuit, uh, when Staples and Office Depot were going to merge, the people at Staples asked me to be on the merger committee for high-tech products, and that was a lot of fun, and we did even more research, and we found out that not only were the, uh, were the more senior users the biggest buyers, but that the new users were actually an unprofitable customer. <laughs> you didn't even want to sell them, <laughs> even if they wanted to buy. So th there's some very interesting things, which, again, Kathy's intuitive insights were absolutely dead on, as we were able to prove later. Um, I could go on and on telling stories, because we were before, and, I, you know, and I, and I could spend two hours. And a lot of it was fun, and a lot of the industry, I mean, it was really fun, and we really worked together. And we really worked together, and we liked each other. You know, and uh, that was before this became a nonprofit industry. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but at any rate, all i got to say, and, and we could talk about this, and I'm obviously glad to ask and answer any questions, but I literally could go on and on and on. There are, there are so many different branches to these stories that you can't even imagine. But it was fun and we learned a lot. And we and as Kathy said in many ways, the it was a different kind of business. One thing she's talked about is inventory. Tom Stenberg, who was chairman of Staples, was the founder and chairman of Staples, about a year or so after or two after they got into uh, high tech businesses, and I'm happy to say I was very involved in that. He said it one of the conferences, I don't remember which one, because uh, he also came out of the, the supermarket business. He said that the computer industry, of all of his history, reminded him most of the supermarket industry, especially the fish counter. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, uh, it's so much fun seeing my old friends and so much fun thinking about the old industry. Glad to talk to any of you any time about it. it, it it's just wonderful. And back to you, John. Yes. Hi, Mike. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the Computer History Museum for this opportunity. I uh, also, it's great. To, it is great to see old friends, both up in the panel and around. But uh, I've been in the business. Uh, Grew up in Procter & Gamble, left Procter & Gamble, got in this business in a very unanticipated way, actually went to go be a ski bum in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And that was in 1981. And I uh, happened upon a person who was a, a local businessman who had, um, had an office supply dealership. And he had just bought a couple of uh, Apple computers and became a dealer of Apple computers. And uh, he told me, hey, why don't you learn this stuff? And to jump off on what Cy was talking about, this industry way back then, which you know, 25 years ago, was always about what the consumer wants, solutions. Today we may call them experiences or scenarios. The industry grew up on productivity. Today there's a lot around entertainment. But there's a lot of things that happened way back when in the industry and in the retail community that is still challenges and opportunities today that we still haven't solved. The scale may be bigger. Retail is, a, is, a, is an amazing place because you get feedback every day. And, um, and it's one of the unique opportunities where um, it's a very effective and economical way to talk to the world. Uh, but today consumers and small businesses don't want to be talked in the general horizontal way, but they want to be talked specifically to. And those are the challenges that we have at retail today. Um, I, I thought I'd throw out a few topical uh, uh, general comments and maybe it may spur some dialogue. But today in retail, um, it's still about the solution. It's still about the experience. It's still about the benefit and knowing that customer. Um, I do think that the challenges we have in the retail community 
Um, you know, there's an old saying in retail that retail is not rocket science, it's harder. Because there is, a, there is a science to retail, but there's also an art to retail. And I think we are in a place today where the art of retail, and specifically as it relates to multi-channel retail, with what's happening with digital content. I've been in the software business for all my career here, 25 years. Um, and what's happening with digital content and, and new ways of reaching the consumer and how do we service that consumer. And you see some things that are very cyclical. Back then we had computer dealers that had to explain how did that thing get from that machine to that printer. I mean that, and you had to explain those things. And you have some of those same type of scenarios today. And you're seeing the emergence of more technical services and more integration services both for consumers and small businesses. And those channels are new channels of distribution. I will give you a fact. At Microsoft in, in the US, in our retail channel, we sell more copies of Office through our tech services channel, through the, the geek squads and the fire dogs and the tech pros and the mobile techs than we do off the shelf. And that consumer is telling us something that they want a solution. They want an experience that they can realize right now. In retail, in the, in, as convergence happens, we've been talking about it a lot, um, as it now is becoming more of a reality, as there's new ways of buying. We know, for example, that 70% of our consumers that buy product at retail actually shop online. And how do we merge the online retailing with the physical retailing? And how do we work with these new business models on how the products are actually brought to the consumer? Because today we have hardware, we have software, we have services that are tied to it. And how all those things come together? And how do we talk to the consumer in a way that they want to be talked to? I think those are the great challenges we have in retail. But it does go back to the core issues that I think this industry was found on. Was It was about the solution. Simplicity is always one. As I go through my career, be it, um, I, and I remember the Ben Rosen story about um, with, I worked for a company, uh, a little software company here in Belmont, California called ANSA Software. They made a product called Paradox. And um, I remember Ben Rosen explaining that the new query by example, the ability to access data from a database in a user-friendly way was, was going to seize the day. And that simplicity continues to, to, to drive through everything we do. So the more and more we at retail can make it simple for the user, for the specific user, the general user. I have a story that just happened to me two weeks ago. I was uh, on a panel with a number of consumer brand companies sponsored by Walmart trying to figure out what the store of the future looks like and how we address those kind of issues. And we did some home checks. We went into the slums of Mexico City to go see what low-income users and what there was going about. At Microsoft, we often say, we've, we've, we've met a billion users in the world, but there's about four billion more that don't even know us. And how do we address those others and that low-income user? And you walk into these homes with really the, the, the slum of, of Mexico City, 500 square feet, families of five and six, and you see a big flat screen TV with a gaming device. It was just mind-boggling to me. It was just mind-boggling to me that the technology and the brands that we bring on how consumers want these and how we can activate those and bring them to in a way that they can consume them easily and simply. I think that's the fascinating challenge that we have around, uh, around retail because retail is a platform to talk to the world like no other platform. So I'll throw some of those things out. I'll shut up from there and we'll go, we'll, we'll let. No, uh, but, but to reinforce what Steve just said, one of the things I got very involved with uh, later in my career when I was doing my consulting was merchandising. And uh, I have to say that uh, I didn't know much about it, and I had the most fantastic tutor in the world, uh, although I don't know whether he realizes it or not, but it's uh, a gal named Signe Ashby, who is Scott Cook's wife. Uh, <laughs> and uh, absolutely phenomenal. And the one thing that she taught me more than anything else that we taught our customers was the simplicity of the message and telling the customer what the advantage was. But we could make an effect 
on actual sales by changing the merchandising, changing the communication of as much as 100 to 150 percent in weeks. To, to build on that, just this is a fascinating thing. If we could think about physical merchandising today, which is really cardboard and signage, if that can get to digital, where now you can get a message in the store, you can get feedback right real time and change that message to understand what consumers need and want. That stuff is, is upon us. And I think that's really going to be the challenge for us going forward at retail to meet those exact things and, and using the tools to do that. We've got a test right now in, in 50 stores where we're actually doing digital merchandising and it's mind-boggling to see how little simple changes of words, little changes in terms of where things are on the screen, how it elevates sales because you're talking to the consumer in, a, in the way they want to be spoken to. And it's just fascinating in, in the, of what retail is and where it can go. And while people may say the you know, with, with digital distribution and new forms of distribution and point of the sale activation that where is retail going to play, I call hogwash. I think people still like to shop and we just got to figure out how we give them the experience in a way that they want it and, and, and we have all that in front of us. But to reiterate the point, many of the same fundamentals and basics that started this industry are still true. We're just going to have to do it about in different ways, which is extremely exciting. Um. You can see why I enjoyed my job, which was covering this business and interviewing folks like this that are so passionate and knowledgeable, right, about this whole business and the industry. Uh, it's fantastic. I do want to open it up for some questions, though. Yeah, I see a hand right here. Brookwood from Inside 64. Uh, one of the things that sort of differentiates retail from most of the other channels is that you have salespeople. And so I have a couple of questions relating to the, the presence of salespeople on a sales floor. Number one, uh, what do you do to train them, or is that still a key issue? Number two, uh, in terms of manufacturer incentives or SPIFs, how effective are those at guiding purchase decisions uh, for buyers? And number three, will electronic signage and all the rest of that eliminate the need for those people going forward? So we always used to tell our clients, uh, was we gave him a, a great big joke. We said, uh, do you know what the difference between a computer salesman and a used car salesman is? I wasn't going to use that joke. Oh, well, uh, the, the answer to that is the computer, uh, the used car salesman knows when he's lying, but... Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump off on that. Um, from a training standpoint, I know from a Microsoft perspective, we think it's absolutely critical. Um, our, more of our marketing mix is going to, to training um, because we believe users want that. Just to give you some numbers, um, as we get prepared to launch Windows Vista in, in Office 2007, we think there's a universe around the world, about 750,000 RSPs that we've got to go train. Now, we have RSPs, retail salespeople, that have to have the three-second pitch, they have to have the minute pitch, all the way to the geeks and the technical service agents that have to have full certification, all those type of things. So we think that's a tremendous opportunity. It's a challenge because labor is one of the biggest line items on the retailer's uh, balance sheet. And so we have to figure out how to do that, but we believe that's a, a huge opportunity. We think there's a lot of technology that can be done uh, relative to electronic uh, certification and training and so forth. There's a number of things along those lines. So um, from the labor standpoint, from the training standpoint, we're actually getting to the point now where we're, one of the challenges in retail is how do you, how do you get the $8.95, $10 hour employee and provide them with a career path? And I think what's happening with the sophistication and as these technical services become bigger things, there's now trying to figure out how we progress those people. And we're trying to help our, our partners to do that through career ladders and competency profiles to build that labor. Now, this is big scale retail. This is the Walmarts and the Best Buys and the CompUSAs and the Fries and so forth. But uh, we also try to make that available to our independent dealers also. Make sure I get to all the questions. That I Hi, Joe Bardwell with Connect 802 Wireless Data Solutions. So I'm curious for for all of you looking from the inside out, where you see the the uh, where where the new technologies like RFID tagging in the supply chain, 
real-time location services, wireless VoIP telephony. We hear a lot of hype that, oh, this is, you know, Walmart and Department of Defense. And, uh, what, where do you see these things playing in, in reality for you? This item. I mean, it's, it's expense. I mean, RFID is still so expensive that to try and tag 200,000 items. Yeah. He's, Kathy's taught me. I, I'm just sort of reminding he's trying her to some track, of the lessons he, she's Yeah, he wants really to track me. Answer. Um, we, we do test most things, you know, store by store. And so we'll test it on one store, and then we'll create it through the chain to see what works. Um, and sometimes we'll do it in different markets, and sometimes we'll do an entire market and test something. Um, and so a lot of these technologies, you know, we've tried in different places, but but specifically a lot of them have a great deal of expense when you look at that and we're still we're still at a level in the computer industry where we can't get UPC codes okay for the new model changed on the boxes okay we, we still can't get that done and so it, it's still we're still at a point in our back doors where we can't scan every product that comes in and, and that's a huge huge issue New, you know, version 2.7 comes out, and it's got the same UPC code as 2.6, and that doesn't work on your shelves. So, you know, we're still campaigning to try and get the the barcoding set, <laughs> you know, and new and changed, and it's and that's a cost factor at the manufacturing side because it's a new packaging or it's stickers or it's labor or whatever. So, I mean, there, there's still a lot of challenges because of the speed of this technology in trying to get it out. And the wireless VoIP, wireless voice over IP for everybody in the store. We'll have a handset and Nextel and whatever. We, you know, that. You know I, I think when cell phones start working. Um. <laughs> I, I hear a generally sort of a, a pessimistic realism. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. That would be retail. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is George Comstock, and um, I'm retired but still interested in the industry. I'm speaking from the perspective of a consumer of products, uh, many of which are purchased at Fry's. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> I've uh, observed uh, uh, what appears to me to be a, a change in the industry, or maybe it's a very natural development that's causing me trouble. And that is, um, I think that there are segments of the industry that are taking on the characteristics of the razor and razor blade trade. And in particular, <laughs> to move from the general to the specific, I'm thinking of ink, ink and toner cartridges. <laughs> No, it's, it's, way, it's way more extensive well, than that. Well, you haven't heard my question yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm afraid this uh, will be directed to some degree at Fry's, because that's the first place I go for a, an ink cartridge. But uh, just in the last um, two or three weeks, um, Fry's has not had the cartridge I needed in stock. And um, I had a discussion with the guy that runs uh, Village Stationers over in Menlo Park about this problem. And he assured me that uh, he'd uh, improve his stocking on such things. So yesterday, when for the second time, there was a blue ink cartridge I needed for my Epson printer that was not still not in stock at Fry's. I went over to Village Stationers. That's a fair drive, especially in rush traffic, and discovered that uh, they they didn't have it either. Yeah. Um, so in desperation, I placed an order at Village Stationers, and they assured me they'd be able to get it from their distributor. And in fact, I picked it up there this evening at 5 o'clock. Um, 
I'm wondering whether some of the improvements that you're seeing in inventory control systems, as you described at Fry's, is going to help us help us consumers uh, on this problem. Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. Hey, you know, it kills me on the razor and razor blade. You know, the ink cartridges are where the money is because it certainly isn't in the printers. So um, it beats the heck out of me what the issue is on that. But, you know, you can give me that skew and I'll get that in for you. Next question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Yano Banks from Radiant Technologies. And uh, I really appreciated what you were talking about with solutions and simplicity um, and selling in the computers and talking about the early days of you would uh, tell them how data got from a computer to a, a printer. I ask the question now in consumer electronics, uh, my business is in there now and I started in computers. Um, you know, it seems now that it's very difficult actually in consumer electronics and the solutions there are now much more complicated than, than even 10 years ago. And home theater and installers and things like that becoming more prevalent. My question is, um, I do not see the retail outlets actually selling solutions for uh, consumer electronics as well as they needed to eventually with computers and selling printers with the, those and so on. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, uh, I've heard of uh, some retailers uh, talking about redoing their stores, but I find them to be very um, departmentalized. And it now makes it very difficult for a consumer to actually get these devices to be together. And if you actually think about a media PC and convergence and the people over in consumer electronics have no idea that they both might have HDMI, for example. Um, it's, it's an interesting problem. I'm curious if you're working on that. Um, but whenever you, we, we talk about the training, um, the manufacturers, whenever they are providing training to the sales associates at retail, is specifically about their product and their technology. Yes. Yes. They're not helping the situation either. And so it's very difficult um, from the retailer's perspective, as I've learned over the last 90 days being back um, in the retailer, of um, the challenges that they have here. And so for the retailer themselves to get on top of this situation of solution selling and the crossover between the CE and the computer space is very complex for them. And um, we really rely on the manufacturers to come with a bigger story, not a feeds and speeds story, right, a bigger story. And it's very difficult for the manufacturers because now you have to look at the universe as well when you're putting together your training materials. And this is, it is a very, very complex situation that I do not believe that the retailers will be able to solve on their own. Having a home network, a wireless network, and connecting to Xbox Live, and how does that experience come to life in the store, and how does, how does that get activated in the home, be it hooking up a flat screen TV to a media center PC, all those things are really, really critical. And I think the, as an industry, especially with our platform, the Windows platform, we have, we've had this broad ecosystem. Kathy talked about, you know, they had an IBM PC, but then they put a different monitor board, and, and, and that's what made this industry grow. But I think this industry has to, has to, a little bit has to contract a little bit, not to be proprietary, but that the integration that's required to deliver the experience that the consumer wants. And it goes across all audiences, all categories. You know, my respected friends from, from Intuit, you know, the idea of what the possibility for small business, the small business opportunity in, in the world, or in, specifically in the U.S., is a tremendous opportunity. And the idea that a small business can now uh, afford a small business server, what then opens a whole new set of applications and a whole new experiences. But who's going to do it for me? And there are consumers that will do it themselves. Many of those are Fry's customers, and we have to talk to them in the way they want to be talked to. But there's also consumers that do it for me, and we have to talk to them in those ways. And so it's our opportunity in partnership to be able to deliver that message in a compelling, clear, crisp way that's believable and to stand behind it. There's a number of retailers out today. I think Best Buy has just launched a program over the last month, which is the Pledge Now that if you buy a high-definition TV, they will have the cables, they will have the con, all those issues that you talk about. And if you don't, we will, I forget what it is, $100 or something. So um, the, these are issues that I think are extremely exciting. And it not only goes around 
convergence or gaming or productivity or small. It goes across all these things. And uh, I think th that's what wakes me up, and that's why I'm still here. I think the Magnolia Home Theater initiatives inside of Best Buys is, is really um, going towards that, and I find it very interesting. Yeah. Tony Mezzapelli, uh, so several of you have mentioned Apple Computer. Apple Computer uh, now has uh, 200 plus stores, growing up quite a bit. The stores are profitable. Uh, and I believe several of you are competitors of Apple Computer stores. Um, they have, right? They have a high sales per square foot. I was wondering what you think they do right and do wrong at their kind of store. I'll start. I think that Apple delivers an incredible shopping experience, right? From the, from the time you walk in, um, there's energy in those stores. And that is something that's very exciting. It's exciting about their box. It's small. Um, uh, what Kathy's been able to do at Fry's and have excitement in a big box is very challenging that they've been able to do, but um, the, the Apple stores are, are fun and you know, who doesn't want to go in there and, and shop and learn, right? It is a very interactive experience. Um, from a retailer's perspective, um, for those of us, for the companies who sell Apple, um, uh, yeah, it's, it is concerning, right? We would love to to not compete with the manufacturer. But to be honest, at retail today, you compete with every manufacturer um, because they're all selling online, whether or not they have stores. And so it does make for um, a more complex um, situation. Um, but man, you can't fault Apple for what they're doing. It, it, they have really, really knocked the, you know, the, the cover off the ball. I think, too, that one of the keys to the Apple Store's success is the iPod, because it has broadened the line sufficiently to give them enough customers. I think if they had computers alone the way they started, they weren't doing all that well. And I think that one of the things in retailing, unless you're just a lucky little store someplace, mom and pop thing, that you need enough SKUs covering enough different areas to bring people in, and maybe you can cross out. Uh, do they have one in New Mexico? Do they have an app? Because uh, you might feel Most places are still waiting for the electricity to come in, so we're having. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get the next question. We have one last question, I think, and then we might have to uh, get ready, but thanks. Uh, my name is Dave Jevons, and I'm uh, CEO of a company called Iron Key, and I'm interested in your insights and how one would go about launching a new product category in retail. What category would that be? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, sorry. Well, I mean, examples, of course, MP3 was a category at one time. Okay. You call a really good consultant. Two one four three four eight forty three fifty. Yeah. Um, what category? Well, privacy category, for example. Oh, okay. okay. You know, a, a new type of software product that there aren't any. Uh, that uh, type of thing. Okay. Yeah, Launching. That guy right back there with the Sling Media uh, badge on. Sling is another. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> launching, <laughs> launching a new tech. Uh, actually, Insider, the com my company, um, is known for launching technologies. It is the most difficult thing that you do. It takes the longest amount of time. You know, you really begin um, once you have a couple of um, manufacturers or publishers in an area. Can you build a category? Launching a new technology is the most challenging uh, job there is. Also, the most rewarding. Um, but the one thing that you need more than anything is patience. The second thing is money. So, you know, if you have those two, but it the. I don't think we could probably get into all the nuances tonight, especially at, at this late hour. But um, uh, more than anything else, it's you know understanding the marketplace and the need for the product. Do, do you um, think it's? It, do you think customers come to stores knowing what they want to buy, or is there an educational process really in a store to pick up something they didn't know? Well, uh, the the answer is if you can attract them, and, and here we get into merchandising. You have, you have to get them to want to look at something that tells them that the product, that the category is there. And how you merchandise it is, is terribly important because if you don't know what you want, 
you can't ask a, uh, a salesperson. So your own merchandising has to communicate enough to get the guy to at least pick up the package and, and read the back. Uh, and if you don't have the good merchandising, I don't, I don't think anything is possible because when you're going in for a new category, especially most people don't even know it exists, you have to tell them. But shopping is a entertainment. Yeah. So a huge percentage of our customers just come in to look. Yeah. You know, they're not even coming in to buy anything. They're just coming in to hang out. And, you know, our, you know, we're still, you know, like the Nordstrom's for men. I mean, that's still predominantly, you know, what we're like, you know, women like go, uh, I just need to go shopping. I'm just going to go over to Nordy's for a bit, you know, and, you know, a guy wants to go out. He's either going to go to Home Depot or Fry's, you know, it's like, I just want to go hang out and like see what's out there. I mean, so I got to say one thing and finally is that Fry's, as I said before, it is a cult who truly understands its customers and they are the ones who come in, hang out, they visit the store. I don't know whether you have the actual data, but the data that we had several years ago when I had my consulting company, they come into the store several times a month, and they spend a long time there. And they're, That's because we have snacks and, that's and why, bathrooms. And that's why, merchandising, that's why merchandising is terribly important. If you can catch their eye. And by the way, old Procter & Gamble study, which was one of the companies didn't think they were right in the computer industry, so they spent a billion dollars in reproducing it. They found that in the environment, in order to catch the eye, you had less than two seconds from 10 feet away. And if you don't catch your eye and give them a message in that amount of time, which means your merchandising has to be really great, forget it. You'll never get a new product out, a new category out. Thanks for your insights. You know what? They'll share more with you too, because this is just a very <coughs> this is a generous group, and there are a few others uh, like them. But this is what has helped build this whole this business, industry. this whole channel, on the manufacturing side and the channel side. And uh, you know, I appreciate all of your uh, questions and patience and uh, stamina through the, this, this all. Um, but please um, join me in thanking all these folks today. And Keith. And Keith, on behalf of the trustees and, and all the members of the Computer History Museum, I first want to thank Fry's for being the sponsor of tonight's event. And all the people, Bill Campbell, Keith, Kathy, Ellen, Cy, and Steve. What a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. And we have a very small, very small present for you that, that Pam is going to give to you folks in remembrance of this evening. I hope you'll come back and hope everyone else will come back and enjoy themselves. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.